And here we go. Good evening and welcome to this special edition of Showtime TV. I'm your host, Omar Rashida, live on uh, Facebook Live, Zoom Facebook Live with two beautiful ladies here. We have Elizabeth Perkins and we have Sister Lorraine Muhammad. Ladies, good evening and thank you for being a guest on tonight's program. Good evening. Thank you for having me, Omar. Good evening. Thank you for having me, Brother Omar. Oh, yeah, no problem, no problem. Okay, the topic of discussion is a very sensitive and serious subject of survivors of abuse. I know both of you ladies uh, felt free in the past to, to, to share your experience as being victims of, of abuse. So we want to start off with Sister Lorraine. Um, just give a brief, um, I guess, rundown in terms of um, your, your abuse history. Uh, was it physical? Was it mental? Was it verbal? Um, what all, what happened? Well, um, first of all, my name is Lorraine Muhammad. And um, I just want to say that it was, uh, it starts out um, verbal, but it can come into a degree of being physical at a point. But my thing was more so mental, mental abuse. So I didn't understand what it was, but it, it was called, it's called gaslighting. Okay. And it's more so to make you feel that you don't know what you're doing, how you're doing it and what your mindset is. And if anybody know, you can look up gaslight and I can give you the definition of it, but it also could be physically or mental abuse as well. Yes. Okay, okay. Um, Elizabeth? Um, uh, what I went through, uh, it was like, like what she's saying about the gaslighting, but um, it was very verbal until the end when mm -hmm. I decided not to take any more of the uh, mental abuse and then it got to physical where I was literally running for my life. Um, and he was chasing me with the butcher knife um, wow. in the morning. And I, I, I remember uh, two gentlemen had stopped for me and they took me to the police. And he actually went back to the house, um, back to my house where he wasn't supposed to be and um, climbed in the bed, act like he was asleep when the police had got there. So, so let me ask you two ladies, I'm start off with, with Elizabeth and Sister Lorraine. Um, how, how did the abuse uh, start? I mean, w w was it a physical, uh, this, well, I'm sorry, but was it a verbal argument or did, did you not do something that he wanted you to do? I, I'm trying to get in the mind of, of the abuser. Um, what, what, what led to the, the abuse in, in some of your cases? I know every case may not be the same, but just give me some examples of what, what led to, to the abuse. We'll start off with Elizabeth. Um, what led to the abuse was um, we were both um, working very uh, prestigious jobs. I was at the hospital and he was at a law firm and um, he just got uh, caught up in the money. And as he got caught up in the money, um, hanging out with the wrong people, he got into drugs. And when I found out that he was um, doing drugs, that's when I started putting my foot down and he would go missing for days. Um, he would... Um, take my money out of my bank uh, without letting me know that he did it. He would deplete my funds. Um, and at one time he actually uh, st uh, stole my car, even though we were married, he actually stole my car to get drugs, to lend it out for drugs. And that's how the, uh, the physical aspect came into it. Um, he was very verbal um, coming in, didn't want me to have any friends, try to keep me sheltered, didn't want me to do anything. And, um, but then when I found that he was doing drugs and stuff and it wasn't healthy for me and my children, I decided that I had to make a choice to leave the situation. And that's how it has started. Now you said something that's, uh, that's prominent that many people may not be aware of. Um, there's a such thing as financial uh, abuse, um, especially when it comes to domestic violence, you know, people yeah. can withdraw, withhold funds, um, not allow you to, to, to get things, to meet your needs and necessities. So. Um, yeah, financial abuse is, is it's it's uh it's it's included in, in yeah it was it was abuse. crazy it was crazy because I after I divorced him he threatened me and stalked me for years so I ended up paying him uh five hundred dollars every month to stay away from me it was it was crazy he had that kind of control wow that's wow. Neat. Yeah. Lorraine well when it all uh, um I just wanted to say Elizabeth that's true because um, when it comes to drug addiction, I think the drugs is somewhat take a hold of the individual 
and makes them become, especially if it's a highly addictive drug like crack cocaine. Yes. It, it, it makes them more um, accessible to those who are around them that they love. I don't think it was intentional, but it, I think it's the addiction that pushes the individual when you uh, decline that you want to give them the money or you want to help them or you want to use with them, then that's where the, um, the domestic violence come in. It's, it's an attack on the person that's close to them. Mm-hmm. And if, if you become a codependent, which I was which I was told I was a codependent because I would, I would actually give just to say, okay, let me just give this to him so he can get away from me. Right. My way of dealing with it, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But as time go on, I got sick and tired. I was sick and tired, sick and tired as myself. Yeah, I wanted to make a change and I wanted to get out the relationship. So I tried to seek counseling and everything that was possible. So mm-hmm. as time went on, um, the drug just, it, it just takes over. It just takes over the individual until they realize that they're sick and tired, sick and tired and they need help. And I think that's the, I don't think the domestic violence was by choice. I think mm-hmm. it was more the- I, and, and, and on that too, Lorraine, um, he had he was abused in that way too when i say abuse i'm talking about you know he had a dad that was drinking and he had a mom that was a closet drinker Uh and so um when i met him like i had nowhere to go i was in foster care so i was um staying with anybody that could stay with um and i stayed i ended up staying with them him and his family and so i got to see firsthand of what was going on and i just i felt like I owed him something or oh, okay. I owed the family something. So that's why I had got married. And um, it was something that I just said, I just don't want you to do this. And he was already drinking and getting high with his dad um, when we had met. And so when I went, well, after we got married and moved out, we would go over and I would be the babysitter for his sister's and him and you know his friends and stuff would you know so that I was because I wasn't drinking and I never did drugs so I was the sober babysitter while everybody oh, okay. was, <laughs> everybody was in the house was right, right. getting drunk and drunk. getting high and stuff like that. Yeah. All right, so, so so let me ask you, ladies. Um, there, there are times uh, where the victim of abuse could I'm not saying it's always necessarily true, but could blame him or herself for being abused. Uh, for example, if I would have just, if I wouldn't have got him or her angry, he or she wouldn't have beaten me. If it's about to have his dinner ready on time, he wouldn't have beat me. If I had iron his clothes, he wouldn't have beat me. So I want to ask you ladies, uh, during the, the period, well, first of all, I want to ask you, how, how, how long were you abused? And then also during that time you were abused, did you ever blame yourself for, for being the victim? Um, let me go first. <laughs> oh, sure, sure. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I, my, I think I was a little bit different because like, like I said, I came through uh, foster care okay. and I just felt like, you know, I owed this family something for, you know, taking me in. And when I was, and I had no place to go. And I, I always knew that it was wrong, what he was doing. And I never uh, posed it on myself um, because I have been molested as a, as a young child, which was why I was in foster care. But um, I never looked at it like it was something that I did. I, but I did feel like I, I, I made a mistake getting married to somebody um, that I already knew was a big red flag. But um, I went through with it because, you know, um, going through foster care and you don't have anybody, family means everything to me. So to have an inkling of uh, family um, set at a home, it it felt good to me to have a family and I was going to fight to keep my family together. I didn't want to be separated as me and my siblings was um, from my mom or from my siblings. So that's why I stayed in it so long. But after a while with my children, I was saying to myself, no, because I had three children that were disabled and I was taking care of them and I, it, I was doing it alone, which was very hard. Um, so I just had to get out of the situation. I was scared to get out of the situation because he would, uh, threaten to shoot me. Um, he actually put a gun to my head at one time and told me if I was to ever leave him that, you know, he would kill me. 
and then he would turn the gun away like on my on my left side of my ear and shoot the gun he said see i i could have killed you right now and he would do things like that to wow. uh keep fear in me that's brother and, and, and so and so how long did the abuse occur oh my gosh i was with him for um, i'm gonna say 25 years wow yeah Right out of junior high school, yeah. That's, that, that's two decades and a half. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. a long time. That, that, that's a long time. Uh, Sister Lorraine, um, how long were you abused? And uh, did you ever blame yourself for, for being a victim? Well, um, it, it started with, uh, it, it didn't start out in the beginning as abuse. It came with okay. addiction. We both were uh, addicts at the time. And I was trying to get myself together to come out on recovery. So I had a lot of help with my family, but they didn't really know what was going on. But they kind of figured out what was going on because I would just get off the phone early, which is a point that it wasn't so much physical. It was more of um, mental abuse. Are, are you off the phone? Are you on the phone? Who are you talking to? You're talking to somebody mm -hmm. that kind of, it wasn't so much physical. It was more of, and to, if you lightened it up, you had to learn, Elizabeth, we all learn as uh, domestic violence, you learn their behavior. So yeah. you have not to get them excited mm -hmm. to the point where you will get physically, You, you your mind clicks. Oh, okay, sure, it's fine. No, it's nobody on the phone. Uh, I think yeah. it's your brother. It's your, you know, we knew how to, We you knew how to, wiggle yourself out yeah out. you know you knew so you didn't want to get hit or hurt or or or, or make it escalate until it could become uh, uh physical yeah that so is true your mind you you start using your mind saying well oh you know no it's what yeah anybody. and yeah so the first thing they like to do is get you away from your family like oh, i don't want you going over to your family i don't want you uh over to your sisters i don't want nobody here in my house well we were living together Right. So that's where it all starts at is a form of control where they try to take you away from your family. So those are the signs that I try to recommend young women and people who are out there when somebody want to take you away from they find your family so they mm -hmm. can have you alone so they mm -hmm. can have you to themselves. Yeah, and that's where the all the control. But my family, you know, I'm from New York. They'd be like, yo, what you doing? Where are you at? You know? Right. <laughs> so, you know. They were really like a part of it and trying to get me out of it. And then I'm trying to seek help, like right. to get my way out of it. As right. far as the first thing was to get myself off of drugs. Right. As long as uh, I was continue to be on drugs for a very, very long time, many years. Mm. And um, I think that became uh, like Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth, Sister Elizabeth said that to the breaking point was like, I got to get out of this. Yeah. And it also helped because then I got I got help. I got a recovery. I went to rehab. I relocated to Delaware. My family was a great support. So, you know, it pushed me to become a better person so now mm -hmm. I could reach out to others to not to get trapped off in that same um, thing uh, because it also could lead to death. Yeah. Uh, domestic violence is nothing of serious to play with. And I'm not mm -hmm. bragging about it. I'm not happy <laughs> about it. Like Elizabeth said, you know, she had a gun put to her head. I didn't get to right. escalate to that. But not only have guns been uh, situated, women have got killed. Yeah. You know? And that was the that was the ending of our relationship because he, um, like I said, when uh, he came to my house, I was taking my children, I took my youngest son to school mm -hmm. and I forgot something in the house. My son was sitting in the car. My son was like 15 at the time. And he actually came up to the car he had a conversation with my son and then when I came outside he was out there and he was like you're gonna be with me I mean it was so, he did so much to me I was so scared to even drive my car because he loosened the nuts on the wheels on my car and things like that oh, wow. oh, and nice. um so uh, he ended up taking my car I ended up calling the police this is how it all ended um I ended up calling the police when he took my car the police came to my house, but this mm -hmm. man had the audacity to drop our son off and then drive back to the house when he, and waited for the police officer to leave. The, the police officer was outside for so long after he took my statement and everything. Um, he had the audacity to come back to my house once the police officer left. So when he came to my house and knocked on the door, I thought it was the police officer outside. And it was him coming in with this big buck knife uh, 
to wow. stab me to death. Yeah. Wow. See. That, that, that's rough. Listen, uh, I, I wanna, before we go on, I want to go back to you mentioned you, know, you, you were sexually abused um, as a child. Um, how old were you um, when, and as a child when you were sexually abused? And, and did you know at that particular time that some, something was wrong? Um, I knew that I was scared. Um, I was about four. I knew oh. I was scared. Um, and he, it would, he would come and uh, at nighttime and take me out of my bed in my sleep, put me behind a couch and, and uh, things like that. I knew that I was scared, but he always told me if I said something, he would do something to hurt my mom or he would do something to my cousins. Um, he, would, he also had stated that he had, he had been with my sister and he was molesting my sister and my cousins. And I was just so afraid. And he was saying that, you know, you're gonna make it bad for all of you if you don't comply, if you tell. Oh wow! Well, that's what they do. Yeah, yeah that's pretty well. So, so um, that is a traumatic experience, you know, from your childhood. Both you ladies uh, experienced traumatic experiences, uh, not only being abused as adults, but in your case, Elizabeth abused mm -hmm. as a child. So, Sister Lorraine mentioned that, that she went through counseling, got treatment, and recovery. Um, mm -hmm. uh, for for being molested and being a victim of domestic violence, have you ever uh, received any counseling or therapy? Um, when I um, when I got when I was molested as a child, no, I didn't get any. And then I got, um, then I got raped when I was 11. I actually just had a couple of weeks ago, had to go to court because he uh, is trying to get paroled and I had to be at, at court a few weeks ago. But um, no, I didn't get any help for it. I ended up getting help. I was maybe 34, 35. I had to get help for myself because uh, I, it was affecting my relationship with my marriage and it was just, it, sex was nothing that was pleasing. It wasn't, I didn't never want to be touched. It, I mean, it just made me feel like a stone. Like I would feel like I just turned into a rock if somebody would touch me. So I knew that I had to um, do something about it. And then I had sat down and then, you know, it's strange about that too. When, when you're in an abusive situation and they know your situation, they would say, if you leave me, somebody else is going to take advantage of you. Somebody else is going to rape you. Somebody else is going to molest no, you. Terrible. They say these things to you. He has said these things to me. So, you know, they take and use your abuse against you to continue to abuse you. Right. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, during, during your abuse, uh, did, did any of you as individuals or your friends, your family notice a change in, in your behavior. Uh, for example, let's say prior to the uh, relationship, you, you were outgoing, you, you, you were the, 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 the joy of the party, this, that, and the other. Yeah. But, but there have been abuse. Did you become isolated? Did you become depressed? Um, did others notice a change in, in your behavior? Let's start from Sister Lorraine, then um, Elizabeth. Yes, it, it, you, you can start seeing the change because um, when I became a closet addict, you know, I would go home, go to work and just get high and stay home and not really uh, just trying to uh, medicate my pain and my and my relationship as being abused by mm -hmm. um, covering up with drugs. I figured, you know, and you know, people was like, oh, what happened to her? Where is she? Oh, I don't feel that well. Oh, I'll, I'll be there. You start um, not showing up on time for certain things. But um, what, what scared me so much for many, many years, over 15 years, I was a functional addict, mm -hmm. but I couldn't hide the abuse. That's what brought out the addiction and then people start picking up because I could go to work, come home, go shopping, fix up my house. I wasn't raggedy, hanging on the corner, begging for change. I would go to work, functional, wait until the weekend, get high. That's how it all starts. You know what I mean? But then it starts with the phone calls, they're not showing up at the barbecues, not, you know, not being around your family. You start, you start isolating yourself, you start moving back. So then your captive, your um your abuser is noticing that. So now they, they feel that, oh, I got her now. I got her now. Yeah, yeah, I got her now. So who are you gonna go to? You know, who are you gonna who are you gonna who are you gonna call? You know, who are you gonna go to? 
you know, what you know you need me because I got this for you, you know, waving mm -hmm. the drug in front of your hand, you know, and you're like, oh, wow. So my, you know, my thing wasn't just the abuse. It was the addiction on top of that. Right. So I had to really get out of, um, once I got strong, you got to get away from your addiction to get strong. Mm -hmm. And uh, I seeked help and, and counseling and rehab and treatment. So uh, my, my escape, Elizabeth, was a little different from yours. Mm -hmm. um, I relocated with my family. After I got out of rehab, I didn't go back to people, places and things. I, I, mm -hmm. My family came and got me and I got out of Delaware. Mm -hmm. See, that was my escape to get away from the addiction and also the abuse. Mm -hmm. But the, 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 the thing was, well, well, I'll be back. I'm just going to go to rehab, you know, get myself together so I can keep my job. You know, you, your mind is so I can take care of you. You know, you yeah. have to start saying stuff like that, you know, wow. yeah. I can take care, you know, reversing it. Mm -hmm. So when I come back in 90 days, you know, but in the meantime, I was already packing. My clothes was already hidden. You know, mm -hmm. my suitcase was already filled up that I wasn't coming back. But mm -hmm. you can't you can't address that to your abuser. You say, well, I'll be back, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and, and it's going to be great. You know, as soon as I get myself together to keep my job, money will start coming in. Mm -hmm. OK, you know, you have to make them seem like it's, this is for you. But right. in the meantime, my family and myself, we had an escape plan. Mm -hmm. After rehab, I was never going back. I was coming to, um, I was going to leave the city of New York mm -hmm. and come straight to Delaware and never to return. I've been down here almost 20 something years, never mm -hmm. went back and never mm -hmm. picked up a, 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 never picked up a drug again. I thank mm -hmm. a lot for that. Right. Now, now did, you, did you ever go back in terms of just visiting family or you just never went back at all, period? Oh, well, um, something is, uh, I wanted to share, it's, it's not social, it's not Scientology, it's called auditing. Okay. And auditing is a place with of uh, Ron Hubbard, but it's auditing through the Audible Minister Louis Farrakhan, and they have a place called the AUG. And what they do, uh, we had sessions, and it's called auditing. You sit down with your auditor, and you um, uh, you get audit. You start talking about your past and what happened. And one of the things that came out of my auditing was the simple fact that I needed to face my uh, I needed to face my um, abuser. I needed to go back, either it was in writing or physically, you know, uh, associating myself with the person or a phone call, and which I did, but I always was going back and forth to New York when I got stronger, not immediately. Right. As time went on, you don't want to rush back, you know, and then get caught up in the same thing. But I got so many compliments. Oh, your weight, you look good. Your skin looks great. My family was all excited. So I was strong enough by um, auditing. I think that's one of the best things uh, that a person can do. Um, L. Ron Hubbard has a thing called Scientology, but that's not what, what I'm talking about, the religion. I'm talking uh -huh. about the dynamics of it. It's called Dynetics. And I picked up the phone one day, and I didn't even know if it had the same number. And um, I called and I made an appointment to meet him at a, a, a open place, you know, like a restaurant or something, nothing closed in. And, you know, I had my, I had my, I had my family around. I had my family around. Yes, I know. So um, just in case. So that was one of the things that helped. Mm -hmm. facing and um to be um to omar to be uh it took me many years to even do it to even face him myself it took many right. many years and uh we met at a restaurant and we talked and, and you know i just wanted to know why why did you you know why did you do those things right you know why and and like um elizabeth uh, sister elizabeth said he was abused i never knew that okay See, i never knew that to, yeah. you know at first I never knew that and he was uh, also in um foster care and different things like that see mm -hmm. I didn't know that mm -hmm. so when the when he started using all of that came out the anger the frustration and everything and we talked um I won't say his name or anything but he's oh, wait, wait. changed his life around and he's married to a Jehovah witness now and and he listens to uh Farrakhan and you know he we talk about those things but um I think audit and dianetics did things to me uh, that helped me with my engrams because as soon as a man came on to me and his voice was a vol of a volume 
that was mm-hmm. frightening or so what you want sister assalamu alaikum or something I, it would it would turn it would, it would it would give me an engram i'll be like oh no i can't deal with that Not triggers even, they're called triggers triggers yes that's it a little that's mm-hmm. it that's yeah. it that's it yeah. that's it Okay. With me, I, I tried to, I tried to leave. I, my children were younger and I actually ended up leaving and he called the police on me and said I was a missing person, but I had, I took a flight and I left and I had to take a chance on um, leaving my children there with him to have a game plan for myself because though he did that to me, he was a good father. Uh, and, he, and he did, and he do love his children. So I trusted that he would be fine with the kids. So I had left and then they put a, he put a missing person out on me, had the police. I, I wasn't even in the state of Delaware and the state that I was in because I had opted for a job and they found me through my social security number and they came and spoke with me and they said that, you know, they said that I was missing. I said, no, I'm not missing. I left. And so they couldn't, you know, make me come back. But the, um, the doctor that I was talking to at that time was like, it would be best to call and check on your children. And, um, talk to him and you need to start keeping a diary and start writing things down. And that's Mm -hmm. what I had did. And even though I did not want to go back, I did go back because I did not want to lose my children um, because it was like, he, I didn't have family. Okay. Cause I was in foster care. So mine was different. I didn't have no family. I just knew his family Mm -hmm. and I really didn't have any friends because I'm truly an introvert. So um, like, I don't go out unless I have to go to the store or a doctor's appointment. Or like when I had my show, I would go to my show and go straight home. Um, so it, it affected me a lot. And it's like, you know, even now today, I still have triggers. I still have it where I'm scared of the, scared of the, of the dark. I check all my doors and windows. I actually booby trap my house. Um, if somebody was to try to come in because he stalked me for five years and uh, I came home one day and he had turned my, my lights off by the fuse box and none of my lights would come on. Okay. I remember I woke up one, one night and or I seen a shadowy figure standing in at the foot of my bed and it was him. He, had, he got into my house and he was watching me and he used my children, um, our children against me too. Mm-hmm. You know, the children were like, just listen to him, just do what he say. And that's something that I did not want to do. And I didn't want my daughters to think that that would be a good idea to stay in a relationship like that. Um, I stay as long as I can. And like uh, Lorraine said, you know, you get tired of being sick and tired. And I remember I was talking to his uh, sister because he, when he had put that gun to my head, I had went and I talked to his sister because I'm always trying to get feedback before I do something. And she was just like, you know, when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired, you're going to be done with it. And that's um, me. I had to get sick and tired. I had to say, you know what, my children are still young yet. How is it going to affect their school? How is it going to affect them? You know, um, what kind of personality traits would it impact on my children? So I had to take the necessary steps, but he, 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 he threatened me. And then I got into a relationship just so he would not be, because he was like, you don't, you're not with nobody else because you miss me. So I got into a relationship because to show him that, no, I'm not, I'm not missing you to anything to say, I don't want to be with you. And then, you know, after a while, it was like, we went to court um, because he tried to kill me and he's not even allowed in the state of Delaware now. Wow. Wow. Yeah, he's not allowed to vote here. Wow. He's, he's, if he true. gets caught in the state of Delaware, if somebody, if something happens, and and I'm gonna tell you, the blessing in everything that had happened, um, and it's not a blessing in getting raped or molested, but when I got raped at 11, um, Alex Smalls was my lawyer. He's now a Supreme Court judge here, and he is a fantastic Godfather. That's what I call him. Um, so I would go to him and talk to him and he, he would give me the right avenue to go. And I'm going to tell you, when I went to court with him and the district attorney's office said um, they had all of these things and he pleaded guilty to everything. He had to plead guilty to everything. Wow. Um, 
and then he had to leave and they and and I'm not spiteful or anything like that like I didn't want him to because he used to say if I go to jail every day I will be thinking about you and when I get out I'm coming for you you know so he even he was threatening me through then too Mm -hmm. and then so when he got out of jail my my children he still went back to his children and his children was hiding him in my house Mm. still helping their father so it was a lot it was a lot that I went through um to be away from him you know it's a lot that a lot of things that I did that I normally would not do to be away from him um to be stalked to be harassed um is a very scary thing I I I still still certain movies I can't watch it's certain things that I cannot do I don't like to be outside at nighttime there's so many triggers that it doesn't make any sense and the crazy part was um like I said a couple weeks ago I had to go to um court well it's a it, it, it and it is public um it's in public record that the man that raped me, um, Benjamin Crump, I'll never forget his name. And for him to be now having to ask me for parole so he can get out, how dare you? And that's how I looked at it. I got stronger myself when I started going to therapy and the therapist said, like the, like your therapist told you, write things down and, and go and ask questions of why you did. Like I had to face my mom Mm-hmm. okay first because I was abandoned by her I had to face different people in my family and then I had to face um I didn't face Benjamin Crump he was already in jail but I had to face my husband and he didn't care it's like you know I'm putting my heart on my sleeve telling you everything and how I feel but the abusers still continue to use your abuse and your 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 mentality of what right. you're going through against you against you yeah right you know you you mentioned a great deal about children um um if any one of you sat down and had conversations with your children either as children teenagers or adults for example for those of you who may have daughters this is this is the warning signs of an Mm -hmm. abused man stay away from from this uh, particular Mm -hmm. type of man um if someone touches you tell me by the way because the person shouldn't be touching you there uh in terms of your, your sons Mm-hmm. Uh, was there ever fear that, that, that your sons may, may take out the, the, the father and be abusive towards women? Have you said, you know, talk to your son, say, son, never put your hands on a woman? Uh, whoever wants to go first can. I don't have any children, so. Okay, okay. I'll, okay. I'll, 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 I'll oh, take okay. it. When I had, well, we got four children together, two girls, two boys. When I had my daughters, he never bathed my daughters. He never, and it's not that he would do something to my daughters, but it's the triggers in myself from being molested and from being raped, my own triggers. Their father never uh, gave them baths. Um, I talked to their, to my sons about it. And, you know, both of my son, thank God that I raised them the way I did. And they followed me and, and my, my belief and my way of life, they followed that aspect. But when it comes to my sons, they like to be with women that they can control easy. Um, I noticed that with both my sons, they like to be with women that they're, they're, I call them bobbleheads. You know, they just say yes to everything. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that, you know, women should do that. Don't get, I don't care how good he look. I don't care what job he got. You have to sustain your own health and your own um, state of mind when it comes to yourself. It's things that you should not accept in life. For me, I feel like, you know, I, I fell through the cracks when it came to society, when it came to the state, because they would, I would, I would tell somebody about my abuse and then they would call child protective service and child protective service will send a letter out saying that, oh, well, you know, it was stated that your daughter said, Elizabeth said this. So we want to come out and make sure everything is okay. That I do not agree with. The state should not do that because mm. you should never put the rabbit in front of the wolf and ask the rabbit, is it okay? Okay. Definitely. definitely. I mean, yes, yeah, both of you ladies have some powerful stories. Uh, Sister Lorraine, I, I was listening to you when you said that you were addicted to drugs. And I, I see that, that, that you're a member of the Nation of Islam. And one of the first things that came to my mind was, was Malcolm X. If you know the history of Malcolm X, he was a drug dealer. He was a, 
uh, I don't know, gangster, maybe he did this, that, and the other, and he changed his life around after he heard the teachings uh, of his teacher, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. So, um, you know, and the spirituality, uh, religious um, institutions also play a role in terms of treatment and recovery, because a lot of people go there for counseling, people go there for DNA uh, groups. So um, it, it's, I'm gonna ask both of you ladies, um, does your place of worship help shape you to be a stronger woman that you are today? Most definitely, My, most definitely. Um, I could say most definitely. Well, the nation had fell. I was in prior uh, 1970, and they say um, that um, that was uh, prior 75. Mm -hmm. And so when the nation fell, I went back out in the street, and you know, and it wasn't a thing that I. Um, people say, "Oh, you use drugs because uh, something was going on." No, I was with a high scale of uh, people that were in show business. And um, one of the things you have to be careful with in show business and being people with flamboyant, I thought nothing could happen with me. Oh, you know, I'm hanging out, you know, my boss is there, everybody. And the thing is, is that when you are with a crowd of people and you think it's innocent and we're passing around Coke and Coke is the thing, you know, what's in the seventies, you know, it's the eighties now, you know, in the nineties, everybody sniffing Coke and everything, not knowing that it was going to lead up to a deadly drug called crack cocaine, which the government bought mm -hmm. into this country. So as time went back on and uh, thank a lot for the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan rebuilding the nation, um, I just kept hearing it. I, um, my sister said, well, they build the, the mosques, the temples of mosques are coming back. Minister Farrakhan brought back the nation. And I said, really? And they said, yeah, you know, you come down to Delaware, get yourself together. So she used to send me, at that time it was tapes. So at oh, night I would put the cassette tape on and I would listen. And then I heard, you know, just it just come back to me. So I advise anybody that's an addiction or drugs or church or mass or whatever, you can you can get your spirituality and make you strong within. I even um, I was going to some churches. I went to um, the Buddha on 94th Street in Manhattan, Namye Renge. I went I was searching in different areas. I just didn't go straight right back in, but I was going to some churches. They would give out, you know, pamphlets and recovery. And um, uh, I was chanting Namye Renge. I, I went into the African built uh, the, the African eccentric, uh, the Moors. I was like all over the place. But one of the things that I came back to my natural self is becoming back to the nation of Islam and empowering myself and empowering other women, uh, not just on addiction, but then also helping themselves. And anybody that can um, get audited, they have um, audit and Dynetics. I think that was one of the best things because even though I stopped using drugs, I still have what you call engrams. And that, like you, you call it triggers, Elizabeth. Yes. It's also, I would suggest that to anybody. You can get the book, it's called Dianetics with L. Ron Hubbard. And you can get the video, it's free. If anybody needs any assistance, you can inbox me or whatever, and I can send you that information. But Omar, I just want to thank you for allowing me to come on the show to share this because definitely, definitely. something came up and it's in my immediate family, domestic violence and drinking. Okay. And um, yeah, and, and with this uh, quarantine and this pandemic, um, if you look at the statistics in African-American homes, it has escalated. Yeah, yeah. You know, so. Because a lot of people are home and they're not working, so. You know, right, but, and they're home and they're drinking and and, mm -hmm. and, and um, they're, they're trying to cope with certain things and, 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 and then that's when the abuse starts. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Wow. Uh, for me, um, I, I went through different schools of thought. And, mm -hmm. but the thing is, when you go through schools of thought, you have to have their thought. And I'm, I'm very strong minded, I'm very opinionated. Um, I was in the mosque at one time um, when 9 11 had, um, had, when we had 9 11, that's when we were told to come out of our garments because they were um, deporting a lot of people. And I had a, a problem with that because my dad is from Dominican Republic and I didn't, they were looking at me like, am I an American? And, but I went through the schools of thought, but I, I looked at schools of thought of, look, looked at it like this. I have my own opinion. And if I have an opinion about something, you're not right because this is the right way to do it. And I don't, I don't deal with control very well because I believe that I'm a very strong minded black woman. And that I have um, 
resources of my own, you know, I think therefore I am and I have to make myself stronger. I can't go to somebody to, to make me stronger when you're just feeding me something out of a book or you're just feeding me um, something that you believe in, um, different schools of thought. Um, I don't want to say which ones they are, but I've been through a school of thought where, you know, they were so opinionated that it didn't make any sense. And it was like, oh, well, it's AIDS out here because of gay people. And I disagreed with that. Um, I am all about science um, when it comes to disease and things like that. And um, I went through a school of thought where the men were the dominant ones and you're supposed to just listen and submit. And I would not do that either because, you know, I'm put on this earth to, um, to uh, share and uh, learn from one another as we all were put on this earth to learn from one another. And so I had to take it upon myself to, to make the decision to say, you know what, I need to get me some help. And I didn't go through schools of thought. I went to a doctor. I went to a therapist to get some help. And yeah, they wanted to put me on medication and say, mm -hmm. oh, she's bipolar and all of these kind of things because I had so many different types of fear. Fear is not bipolarism, okay? Fear has nothing to do with that. So the best thing that my therapist told me to do was write things down. And when I started writing things down, um, I ended up meeting my husband and I shared with him what I was doing. And he said, you know what? You should write about it to help somebody else. And that's when I first wrote my first book, which is Testament of a Child, The Heightened Awareness of Child Abuse. Right. And um, from there, that's how I met you, Omar. Oh, and yeah. Oh, Omar had me on his show and we talked about the book and things like that. And I had so much. No, wait a minute. Uh, I think we first met when you was in my play. I'm sorry to interrupt. <laughs> no, I was in your I was on your oh. I, I was on your show for my first book, A Testament of a oh, Child. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. All right. Well. Yeah. And then <laughs> I was in, yeah, then I was introduced to your plays and okay. they're, you're oh. incredible, uh, Omar. I just gotta tell you, you're so incredible. <laughs> and so I went on from um writing my book, Testament of a Child to being a organization, which I started the organization and founded the organization, which is Crimes Against Women and Children and started helping in that way. Any way to be a voice, to be an advocate, to help someone else, to be a voice because I didn't have anybody to be a voice for me. So, and I knew there were others out there like me that had been through um, foster care and didn't have anybody that cared about them and went through the same avenues that I do, that I have been through. Right, right. And, uh, you know, you, you provide, you know, community service with the organization that, that you founded. And uh, Sister Lorraine, you, you, you've you been out there. Um, I, want you, I want you to talk about the community service that, that you do, because I, I seen on Facebook last week where you were giving free, uh, was it fish dinners and chicken dinners? At the, at the, uh, that was through the mosque. That was the outreach. Okay, but, yeah. Um, so talk, talk, talk about the work you do in the community. because you, 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 you Okay. Um, um, my organization, the founder, president, CEO, is uh, Our Time. And okay. um, um, it's the Ministry of Love. And um, in order to, for me to heal myself, um, I took the opportunity and I had Elizabeth working with me. I had several events and guest oh, okay. speakers come in and mm -hmm. speak to those uh, um, reform from, uh, from, from, from the pipeline to the prison, uh, um, addiction. I had uh, uh, people, uh, gangs, uh, let's stop the violence uh, with the peacekeepers. I joined the 10,000 fearless and um, I went to different shelters where women were in shelters. I was in a shelter myself and I um, spoke to women and how to come out of it and get yourself together and come. And uh, Elizabeth uh, come with several times and spoke, we worked together before. Mm -hmm. So my thing is right now with the pandemic is to um, I drop off food boxes. I get for, if anybody um, out there is a Lutheran community is Monday and Wednesdays, you can get food boxes and uh, elders. I have my little pick. They call me my mom. <laughs> this is, and, I, and here I, they're, they're elders and they, they say, you know, and it makes me feel good. It makes me feel good about myself and a way of giving it back. In the midst of this pandemic, I say this, you can do the social distancing but distancing yourself from another human beings and the ones you live. Because when I ring those bells and I ring the bell and I drop off their food box, I get a sense of, of an air hug, but then I give a sense of connection, letting them know that somebody's there for you. 
And that's human beings. We're not animals. Even an animal need a pat, a hug, a pat on the head or something to know. So um, God put it into me. You know, I still reach out. I still go to uh, to, to, to rehabs, different places if they ask me to come. The 1212 Corporation of uh, 28th in Washington, I, you know, help with food. I go to the masjid, you know, I help with the, um, the nation, nation of Islam, um, MGT, Muslim Girls in Training, and feeding out there. Wherever anyone needs me to come, I'm there. My number, um, our time, my wing sing, 333everizon.net for email. Any outreach that anybody, a motivational speaker, I'm there. Uh, that is awesome. But let me ask you too, I want to stay with Sister Marie and then Elizabeth. Um, once again, both of you ladies are victims of domestic violence, survivors of domestic violence. Um, after you had left the abusive relationship, um, was it difficult, difficult for you to establish um, other relationships, in particular with men? Because, I mean, was there fear that, you know, you may have been abused once again by another man? Um, how difficult was you to, to continue to have um, effective relationships? This is Lorraine, you first. Oh, okay. Um, like I said before, through Dianetics, um, auditing and um, seeing what my engrams were and working on myself, you know? Um, it took many a years of reading the books and tapes and um, feeling comfortable with myself. So if I know um, I've gotten to the point where I know that I can actually get into a relationship because is you know you know you don't have a a book like a driving school book that tell you well when you get to the light it's red and when you get to the uh, stop and when you see green you go so all these instincts that um, that a person that's been abused or domestic violence or whatever we can see them it's it, I mean you can feel it you can feel it in yourself well this is not something that I would go into so I don't dive into a relationship or a courtship anymore and one thing the person that I would um, consider that the person that they get auditing with me and they get dianetics they get help as well because I think living in this country all of us is a little got a little something going on that might need help seriously Right, so right, um, right. that's one of the things that I would put out there would be dynamics and sit down before I jump into another relationship and then just go spiraling down because I got engrams. Elizabeth, you call it triggers, the same thing, engrams. So if, uh, if a person mentally uh, uh, heal themselves and um, both of them could be on the same page and find out because like Elizabeth said, I found out that he was molested. So these are the questions even before going into a courtship or a relationship, one should sit down to find out what was the other person going through. So I don't have no fears anymore. Right. Um, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> okay. Well, for me, I had gotten into a relationship with a, a gentleman and he was really nice to me, but he had a lot of secrets. I didn't know like what he was doing, but he would always brag and say, oh, you know, she's a writer and she's this and this. But I ended up finding that he had a drinking problem. And I was with him for seven years before I got married again. But um, I was with him for seven years. And um, I ended up leaving him because he ended up being uh, physically abusive, where he literally would, you know, uh, he had a gambling problem. He'd lose his money. He would come and ask me for my bank card. He would take any money that I had. Um, he would take any um, pills that I had that he could sell or anything that he could get his hands on. And I remember in one evening, he said that we were going to leave. He wanted to take me to Tennessee. And as soon as we got out, let me see, out of the state of Delaware, he, we got a hotel, was supposed to be had resting, but he had stopped to go gamble. And when he came back, he had lost the money that he had with him. And he came back to the hotel and he wanted to fight me over the money that I had. And he snatched all my clothes off mm. Mm. and he tied me up with a sheet and he beat me in the face with a, a water bottle. He, a brand new water bottle, unopened. He beat me in the face with it. And I knew I said, if I survive this Lord, I'm done with relationships and things like that. This man, I had to really, really pray on any relationship that I had came into so when I got into my now marriage you know he don't drink he don't smoke he you know he's god-fearing um 
he used to uh, he used to be a pastor himself, um, and you know um, he is his, he he is uh, we both came, went from Islam to Nuwapian together, and you know he he he's the one that said get some help, get some therapy, and um, so to that got me to go into uh, therapy. But the good thing about this relationship is we we have a friendship relationship, even though right. we're married. And it's not a it's not a sexual relationship because I have my own triggers, and I I just I don't want the I don't want the intimacy because I'm mentally not ready for it um, because it's just so much going on. Like you know, uh, Miss Lorraine said that um, you know with this pandemic things are happening, and I actually had a granddaughter that was molested um, over the summer. Um, of, of last year. So it was, it, it's traumatizing over and over again, you know, and then if for it, it hit one of my grandchildren, it's very traumatizing. So yeah, I'm in a, I'm married, I'm in a good relationship. I'm in a safe place, a place where I trust him. I don't, I have no fears. Um, I still don't like to be by myself. <laughs> I still don't like that. Right. Um, I'm still scared to be alone. Um, even though that the ex-husband is in, another state and the other guy is in another state doing time but the thing is I just don't want I don't know the triggers for me is very severe for me they're very severe because I can't you have to realize I came from four-year-old molestation then right. being raped then being it it, it 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 was just a continuous cycle and I learned about the cycles through my therapist that you know you have to start to break cycles and, and you have to break that link or it will just continue over and over again. So I just started doing things different in my life and started um, surrounding myself with people that I can trust. Um, and I don't have very many friends. I have associates that I do know and I have people that I trust like Omar and uh, Sister Lorraine. I have you guys that I trust. If you guys would say, uh, we're having something over here, would you come out? I would say yes, but if anybody at else would ask me it's hard to get Elizabeth to come out and do anything I don't care where my status is or who I am in my community it's hard for me to just come out and interact because I I, I start to feel are you interacting with me because of who I am or are you interacting are you interacting with me because you're trying to be a little too friendly so like I said I'm an introvert so <laughs> that's where I am with her. Right, right, right. You know, but sometimes people from the outside, they, 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 can, they can perceive, if you can see a female that's kind of like you say, introvert, mm -hmm. uh, maybe she's, she's not trustworthy towards others based on what happened in her past, especially if she was raped or mm -hmm. uh, physically abused. And if someone looking from the outside don't know that, they, they've been misperceived as being, she might be shallow, she, she, she may be stuck up. Um, yeah, I got so that. <laughs> Okay, okay, so you did, so I just wanted to ask you, ladies, yeah. do you ever fear, fear others were coming down on you, but they don't know the history of what, what you went through? What you went through. Yeah, I actually, I actually went through, there was a, a sister that I was friends with, and I did not know she had, and I'm, I'm it's just going to change the subject, but I didn't know that she had um, racial tension amongst us, you know, she was a sister, I'm a sister, mm -hmm. and she looked at me one day and said, you know, you're an author because of what you look like. You're, you got a talk show because of what you look like. You know, you're doing radio because of what you look like. You didn't have to work for it. And you don't know what I've been through, you know, to, for me to even still be here. Because honestly, when you go through, uh, when you, they say survivor, but we're survivors still surviving. Right. right. And, you know, and you have to understand that being a, a survivor, still surviving, we are not so trusting. We, we, we're we very guarded people. And you have people that, you know, come through and they, they get an even a worse predicament. They turn to alcoholism. They turn to prostitution. They can't never come out of it. They can't never come. They, they think that it's the norm to be abused mentally, physically, sexually. They find it and it's it's, accept, it's accepting to them to be abused because they are too afraid to run, too afraid to leave. But you know what? I'm here to tell you, I was 
I was one of those people that said, you know what, I need to stay. For, I was giving myself so many excuses why I shouldn't leave. I shouldn't leave because my kids are too young. I'm not going to be able to take care of disabled children by myself. But you know what? I did it. And mm -hmm. I stood on faith to do it. And you have to do that. You have to believe in yourself. You can't, you can't let somebody take control of the love that you have for yourself to be able to do for yourself. And, and even going through all this, like me and Sister Lorraine, we still have it in us to uh, be advocates for other women yeah. and to be a voice and vocal for other women. And we still give back to our community because it's not the community that did it. It's a person that did it. So we're a voice to help somebody else that is going through or afraid to even say anything because I'm going to tell you, when I said something about me being molested and as I gotten older, going to visit with my mom and stuff like that, my mom didn't believe me. She ended up staying with this man and had a child with this man. And the only reason why he left is because she had a boy. And, you know, that was, uh, that was a, a, a blessing and a curse in itself, you know, because he's scared of boys. So that's why he left my mom. So it's just a lot of things that you go through um, being a survivor, still surviving every day, because you can walk into a situation and it's not, even, it don't even have to be a bad situation. Somebody like, like, Miss, uh, like Sister Lorraine said, somebody could say something or, or try to, uh, or like a man, he always likes to try to dominate and tower over a woman, um, or say things to a woman and then be like, oh, I'm just joking. Don't joke with me. I'm the wrong person to joke with. Don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. You said something that was crucial, that your mom didn't believe you were abused. Yeah. You know, I, I, I would imagine that that's, that, that's, that's even worse than abuse itself, because you have someone who, who and this is your mother, this, this is your number one, this is the lady who brought you into this world. And there are other cases where family members were, were, were told that they were, um, someone was abusing uh, his daughter, aunt, niece, nephew, granddaughter, and they didn't believe him. Man, that, that's, that, that adds more trauma to it, I believe. Yes, it's very hard because, you know, um, I remember as a little girl and, you know, like when your parents are being intimate, you can hear them. He would wait till my mom goes to sleep and then he would come into me and my sister's room. I would pretend that I'm sleeping, and pray that he does not touch me or take me. Um, I was to the point where I was so scared uh, because he, he was not only messing with my mom, he was messing with my aunt too. And he has children with my cousin. But the thing is... Um, I was so afraid of him. If, if, even if I stayed to my um, my auntie house, he would come over there, wow. and he would come and still snatch me out of my bed. I would pray some, and and it, and it may sound bad, but sometimes when he come in there, I pray he take somebody else. Don't touch me, you know. That's how that's how I was so scared, and it and it and it caused me to have insomnia, which I still live with today. Right. Okay. Yeah, because I'm scared to sleep. Right, right. Uh, so Sister Lorraine, um, must, uh, Elizabeth, she talked on her earlier in terms of why she stayed. Um, what, why did you stay in, in, the, in the abusive relationship? Uh, you know, and I mean, eventually you end up leaving, but um, I guess you could have left maybe way before you, you left um, after the abuse, but what, what made you stay? Well, first of all, you consider yourself in my mind that I loved him. In my mind, the person that I met wasn't the person that he became. He was very um, handsome, a uh, hard worker, which you would say a hustler, made money and took care of me. We went to, you know, in the beginning, it was, I just wanted, to, I just wanted him back, the old person that he was. We loved music together. We went out, we went to a lot of shows. You know, we traveled all over the country. You know, I wanted that back. I wanted, I was, I was hoping you know, that one day that I could change him and he could come back to that, to being that person that he was. That was my thing, was hope that he would change, you know? Hopefully he would change. Well, he changed, but he didn't change with me. I had to remove myself and come to conclusion that it's never gonna happen. But you always have that little, I just think he's, he might change, you know, even prayed. You know, I even prayed to God that he would change and he would change his life because he wasn't a bad person. I'm not saying that I think the drugs was more of a, a took a hold of him and uh, the things that he went through when he was young and um, the out of control of, of the drugs and the drinking, you know what I mean? 
So yeah. I think if all those things, I was pray that um, that's why I stayed, Omar. I stayed because I figured one day, you know, hopefully he'll change or if I can help him change, you know. You know what? Let me let, let me say this to you, Omar. I'm a, what made me leave because he, what made me leave because I was gonna do something to him and I didn't wanna be him. I didn't wanna be that monster. And when he would lay down and go to sleep, like I said, I would not sleep. And when I found myself putting a pillow over his head and watching him gasping for air and then I would remove the pillow because I knew he's gonna wake up because he's trying to breathe. And I would pretend I was asleep. And, and I, when I found that, that I was doing things like that, I did not want to be that person because, you know, right that, at that point, I was in a fight or flight state of mind. Anybody that's been um, in the situation of being abused, raped, or kidnapped, which I was at one time. But the thing is, any, everybody that, every woman or man that goes through that in any abusive situation, when you're in fight or flight, you can do anything because right now you're doing this to save your own life. And I decided to leave because I was putting a pillow over his face wow. every night and they got, because and they I did not want him to wake up. Yeah, they, they got you for murder. You know. That's yeah. what I'm saying, yeah. Yeah, but see, that's the thing. That's what that's what saved me. That's mm -hmm. what saved me because see, I know my accountability. I know what I'm responsible for. And when somebody pushes you to that point, to me, it, it was saving my own life mm -hmm. to be choked out and raped every night and you're married to this man and you can't do anything about it. To me, it wasn't, I wasn't murdering him. I was getting rid of him. So he don't hurt me or my family. Right. So right. when I found that I those things was happening that I was doing, I had to get out of the situation. And that's what made me say, I got to go. I don't do that now, but I do sleepwalk now. I am on um, sleep medication, tranquilizers, but I really don't like to uh, take the sleep track tranquilizers because you know they cause memory loss and I've mm -hmm. driven my car in my sleep I've did things in my house almost wow. set my house on fire in my sleep wow. because of the tranquilizers that I am on to put me to sleep because of my insomnia insomnia wow but I have a I have a normal life now but a lot of people don't don't know like that movie that came out the burning bed and everything that that man put that put his wife through and she set him on fire in his bed while he slept these are the things that go through your mind it's not yeah. that we're sitting back here just boohooing and crying we're sitting here thinking like how can i protect myself what can i do and you hear people say all the time oh if it was me i'd knock him upside the head you don't know what you would do unless you was in the situation absolutely yeah yeah you got a lot, a lot, a lot of money night quarterbacks <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> we can talk this back. yeah you're, you're, you're exactly right yeah. okay ladies so, so as we conclude the, the, the program for this evening I want to ask you, ladies, there may be some ladies or, or men who watch right now who are being abused or in an abusive relationship. Um, what words of encouragement do you have from, for, the, for this particular person? Mm -hmm. And also, if someone wanted to reach out to you, ladies, for help or just talk to get some support, um, how can they reach you? Let's start off with Sister Lorraine. Well, the first thing I would say, there are, well, if you're in Delaware or New York is 311, Delaware is 211, there are outreach that way more than it was back. Um, I can say when I was out there, there are helplines that you can call and 1-800 numbers and 211. And there are um, outreaches that could come and help you. And social service is the big thing for domestic violence. They are reaching out more than they did before. But uh, like I said, mine is the Ministry of Love. Um, um, I'm on Facebook, Lorraine Muhammad, Lorraine1955 on Instagram. Um, you could contact me at 302-764-5776. That's my other number. And uh, cell phone, 302-438-7775. But the most important thing that I can say from experience, once you step out to reach out to someone for help, make sure you reach out to the right person. I had reached out to people and they took it for a gossip. Oh, girl, you know that man? He's up there doing this and that. And they, that you know, because everybody have an ear, but they don't have the right ear. 
So, right. you know, if you have a, a, a place of worship, I think that's where the person you should start talking to someone in the place of worship where they could guide you and lead you, you know, to other um, avenues where you can get help. But the first thing is to look into yourself and pray to God and ask God, that's your beginning, you know, to get you out this situation and reach out for help. That's the only way, that's what I can say to reach out for help. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Omar. You're welcome. Okay, Elizabeth? Um, um, I do take emails at elizabethperkins.mp at gmail.com. I have been um, using that email, um, talking with men and women um, that have been through domestic violence or a rape um, or molestation. I My main question is, when am I going to write a book about men that's been uh, molested or raped? So, you know, um, but that's where you can catch me at. If you can, you got to email me. And I will definitely email you back um, again at elizabethperkins.mp at gmail.com. Oh, right, ladies. Omar, did I get my email? Oh, okay. We can give it in case you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's uh, W-I-N-G-S-I-N-G-333 at verizon.net. It's wingsing333 at verizon.net. I'm sorry. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in and watching this thank special you. edition of uh, Showtime TV. Please like, subscribe, and share. Ladies, once again, thank you for being a guest. All thank right. You, Elizabeth, give me a call. I will. Thank you, Omar, for inviting no me. No yes. problem. Thank All right. You. Stay safe, ladies. Peace. Okay. Peace. peace. Good night.